Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this virtual discussion, Resurrection of the Black Messiah, Building Black Leadership in Our Communities. It's going to be a vibrant panel discussion with some dynamic panelists. We're going to talk about that aspect again of resurrecting the Black Messiah, building Black leaders and Black leadership in our communities. From the age of times past, the civil rights, and even our current times, Black people have always sought leaders to move us forward, leaders to help us move towards a space of freedom, justice, empowerment, equality, equity, and social economic standings. And all throughout these times, it has often appeared that we've been going through different waves and iterations of leaderships. And sometimes there seems to be gaps in moments when Black leaders have laid dormant. And thus this panel discussion, we're gonna get into the topic of about Black leaders and Black leadership and has it been dormant? And if so, how do we resurrect Black leadership? Or if you will, how do we resurrect our Messiah? And this concept is of course based on the movie Judas and the Black Messiah. And we're not gonna deify anyone when we're talking about resurrecting the Black Messiah, nor are we going to try and take any uh, parsings of the movie and make this a critique of the movie. But again, we're really just gonna talk about how do we again build black leadership, resurrect leadership if it's been laid dormant or bring black leadership to surface and get resurrect our Messiah, not in any religious or, or theological aspect, but just in the sense of a leader who we as black people can look to to lead and guide us. Not any gender specific leadership, not any type of uh, tyranny or anything of that nature, but just true leadership in our communities and how do we bring that back. So my name's Jeff Jones. I'm the co-host of Community Voice PHL Talk Show, and I'm glad to be your moderator today for this lively discussion with the panelists who I'm about to let do their own introductions. But again, this conversation is about building Black leadership. It'll be unapologetically Black, but it'll be also understanding that those who are on the, the participants may not be of the black persuasion, but we don't want to sway away from the fact that this is unapologetically black about building black leadership, but it's with the understanding of uh, sensitivity of those who will be on the on this Zoom with us as well. And also for the participants as you join, please note that this will be a recorded session, which will be uh, pl played back later on various different platforms. So be mindful if you're not comfortable or not uh, wanting to be on a recorded session, you can uh, make your judgment in that space, but this will be a recorded session. And also, as we get into our panel discussion, there'll be a time for you to have your questions. And I'm going to ask if you could drop your questions in the chat room and we'll fill the questions after the panel discussion and even during the time of Q&A from the chat room itself. So please be mindful, participants, if you will, to drop your questions in the chat room and we'll take the questions from the chat room accordingly and go from there. So with that being said, let me uh, do this in alphabetical order of last name so that no one gets to say you picked me last. <laughs> It was already predetermined because of your last name in that regard. I'll let the panelists introduce themselves and I'll start with uh, Nikki Bagby. Please introduce. Of course, of course. <laughs> Hello, I'm so honored to be here today. Thank you, Jeff, for inviting me out here um, for this awesome discussion. My name is Nikki Bagby. I am currently um, the CEO and founder of A Humble Heart, which is a consultant agency that helps kind of bridge gaps around social determinants of health, as well as um, health disparities as it relates to strategic health plans, uh, health, uh, public health. I also am a casting uh, manager, as well as a public relation liaison. So I want to thank you again. I'm also a community activist and um, someone who believes that it is important that we are vested in our community. So whatever that label looks like, I'm somebody in the streets serving others. <laughs> That's what's up. You're welcome. You're welcome. Gabe Bryant. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Gabe Bryant. Uh, I'm excited to be here. It's an honor to be here. Um, I am an organizer and youth advocate. Um, my work mostly centers around uh, youth development. I also work at the intersections of mass incarceration and justice and how can we figure out ways to combat some of the various terrors that impact of the black community. So again, happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you. Brother Shamari, Eric Keith Grimes. Greetings, uh, Eric Keith Grimes, Brother Shamari. I'm happy to be here, host the weekly radio show on WURD radio called Groundings with Brother Shamari. Come on Fridays, 1 to 4 p.m. and again on Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m. 
I do some adjunct professor stuff at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, just an all around decent brother, um, <laughs> try, try, trying, to, trying to win the revolution for black life. There we go. Independence, freedom, and empowerment, nothing less. There you go, nothing less. And that's all we need. Appreciate you, thanks for joining us in. Jacqueline Jordan. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jacqueline Jordan. I'm the co-host of Community Voice Radio Talk Show. And um, I have about over a couple of decades of experience working with youth, young people in the Logan, uh, North Philadelphia area. Um, I don't know, I no longer do that work anymore, um, but still very much connected to the community in which I grew up, which is Logan. I'm definitely excited to be here, excited to have the conversation. And um, yeah, um, I'm also a writer, writer, blogger, um, and script and filmmaker. Oh, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Heard that community voice is a pretty good show. <laughs> it's all right, you know. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. So let's get into it. Resurrecting the Black Messiah, building Black leadership. So let's get a foundational uh, uh, concept going here. What is Black leadership? Uh, so as we talk about that, I want to have it, you know, be an abstract thing. To what, what does they, what do they mean by that? So when we're talking about Black leadership, what does that mean to each one of you? And, and I'll start like in reverse order of how I introduce the panelists. So Jacqueline, what is Black leadership and what does that mean to you? And we talk about this concept of building Black leadership. What is that? Um, I think for me, Black leadership means uh, individuals who are deeply committed to uh, being in many ways the voice of the people, right? Um, if, if a thousand people can't fit in a room, you know, not all of our voices are going to be heard. So I do believe it's the strategic job of a leader to make sure that all of our voices are heard, but also it's the job of a leader to make sure that they are invested in our community. I think we have uh, too many uh, influencers versus leaders in our communities and not enough people invested um, in the liberation of uh, black and brown folks. Many influencers and not leaders, that's, that's powerful to, to understand. And we're gonna parse that out because we do need to understand the difference between influence and leadership. So, right, you wanna... Gabe. Gabe. I'm sorry, Brother Shamari, how do you, how do you define leadership in that concept? First of all, I was inspired by uh, Nikki's glasses to go get my hat. I had to add some <laughs> sauce, sauce to the game. So thank you, Nikki, for leading me in the inspiration. Um, you know, leadership is, is for me, assuming the, the, the position, the righteous position, the guidance, uh, the direction, the instructional role that, uh, that emanates from this interplay. I call it T. Um, T stands for thought, expression, and action. And, um, you know, it's the interplay between the, uh, what I would call the Jegna, the Messiah, our culture, and then our role and purpose in it. Um, it, it, it it's a relationship. It's not, it's not just an individual role. You can't look in the mirror and declare yourself that. It comes from a relationship. It comes from a reputation. It comes from a track record. So, so leadership, uh, unlike respect for me, leadership is definitely something that you have to earn and it has to be validated by other people mm -hmm. with whom you're in, in that relationship with. Okay, okay. So it has that relational aspect that has to be foundational if I'm understanding what you're sharing. Correct. Cool, cool. Gabe, when we talk about leadership based upon, you know, what, what uh, Jacqueline shared and what, you know, Brother Shamari shared, how, how do you then look at, you know, the difference in being a Black leader in those spaces and just a leader? Is there a difference? Yeah, I think there is a difference. Um, I think in many ways, one would argue that when it comes to somebody being a Black leader, you are identifying yourself with the concerns, the issues and challenges and difficulties of the Black experience in the Black community. Mm -hmm. um, and so when somebody identifies themselves as a Black leader, they are focusing in on, you know, those particular areas of interest and recognizing that those are the areas that kind of dominate and pretty much, you know, I put my investment, right, into those areas. I think it's important, you know, one of the things that uh, you know, Jacqueline mentioned about, you know, having that personal connection, right, um, I think is a critical part of it. And I think it's it's day to day. I think it's a journey. I think that it's not something that you do in one day or one month or even one year. Um, I think that leadership is something that you assume 
uh, by virtue of just making sure that you have a contribution and that your leadership, I think, is 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 merited by your contribution um, day in and day out doing the work. Hmm. Merited by your contribution. I like that. I like that. Uh, now, does a leader have to have that level of contribution that meets all or meets many or how does that play itself out? How do you define black leadership? Am I answering a new question or you want me no, to? It's the same question, just giving a okay, different same question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, the first thing I think about um, leadership, I think about servanthood, right? So, so many times um, um, people don't understand in their positioning. We have to understand that leaders have the capability, they should have the capability first to have a, a form of servanthood. Um, you can't understand what it is fully to, um, to lead unless you have been a follower at some, at some period in time or you're able to be a servant as much as you lead. And everybody, to be honest, Jeff, everybody are not meant to be leaders. Mm. And understanding who you are in that position, and some of us are supposed to be supporters, some of us are supposed to be followers, mm -hmm. but understanding um, the difficulty of trying to lead when that may not be your, you know, your forte, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding who you are as a leader, understanding that the greatest leaders are servants, and understanding when you lead, there's an accountability to leading others than yourselves. So being accountable to others, being um, a servant and being able to lead with not only compassion and sternness, but vision. And uh, there are too many people in this time and day and age in our community that feel that all of us should be leaders and that's not true, right? Um, understanding what leaders are, understanding that there needs to be some kind of training, there needs to be some kind of empathy and compassion, there needs to be some sternness, right? So mm -hmm. understanding first who you are, whether or not you, you are able to take that role on, mm -hmm. and being able to serve in a capacity so that you can lead, um, lead effectively. Wow, so, so now, okay, we have that grounding of understanding what leadership is, what black leadership is. Let's, let's kind of continue to focus a little bit more on black leadership in the black community. Uh, do we see that in ways that we really, really think is gonna uh, surface uh, to make a difference in our, in our world society today? Is black leadership visibly present or do we just have, as Jacqueline mentioned, just influencers who are just getting people to move but not getting people to make progress? Do we have black leadership present in our society today? I'm gonna to challenge each one of you to kind of think and parse that out. Do we have black leadership? Uh, because again, this is about resurrecting black leadership. And if we have black leadership, maybe there's no resurrection needed. But if we don't, let's have a real conversation. Do we have black leadership or do we just have influencers moving people and not making impact? Uh, I'm gonna jump in and ask Brother Shamari that question first, if you don't mind giving an answer to that. I mean, so it's 8 billion people in the world, right? So mm -hmm. the answer is I'm sure that somebody somewhere that's black is a leader. Mm -hmm. But in the context that we, found, that we find ourselves in right now as a collective people in 2021, if we're gonna focus on this place we call America, my answer for that for us, you know, from a strategic, from a, from a cultural perspective is no. Um, particularly if we define leadership as someone who's acting to bring about, um, you know, inspiring others to a higher aspiration of ourselves based on our own self-defining terms. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. And we, we, we probably don't have it because we just saw a movie in a series of movies where people who aspire to that pay the ultimate price which is in and of itself not the issue. The issue that we don't talk about when we talk about leadership is that we got very bad followership as black people. Mm. We, we, because we got, everybody got an opinion, everybody got a personality, everybody think that they can talk and we equate because of the church right. talking and speaking with leadership, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to see what a mug's track record is. You don't have to see what their character is. You don't have to see what their integrity is. If they can drop game, and they can, you know, they can, they can talk, talk you out your money, talk you out of whatever. Then all of a sudden, we, 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 we affirm them in a role of leader. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm saying that we live in a, a country that has the devised the pro. We, if anybody got anything from the movie, please understand. Go back and study COINTELPRO. We live in a country called America that designed a policy 
framework to prevent the rise of a black messiah. And I want to really get into that a little later on. There's a difference between a messiah and a leader. Right. And I don't want to, I don't want to conflate those terms. We really got to do some science around what's at stake here. But we live in a society that has pledged allegiance to the fact that they don't want to see us rise as black people mm -hmm. through black leadership on our own terms. And right now we are playing by that script. And definitely that's the script that we know how that movie ends, right? Right. <laughs> so, and thanks for parsing that out because we definitely have to really look at, you know, where are we going to take ourselves if we call ourselves leaders and how is it, how is it going to come to fruition to make it impactful in a lot of those 8 million people you were, you were saying, were alluding to. So, um, 8 billion in the world is 8, 8 million. million people. I'm sure someone, some, somewhere who, who, who we can say is an individual leader, but for where we are right now, we need a whole different definition and process. Cool. So, wow, Jacqueline, when we talk about that, that process that Brother Shamari is saying, building uh, Black leaders and, and understanding that um, we have to come from a space of, you know, moving it towards a space of impact. What do you think about Black leadership today? Is it present? Is it, is it strong enough? Is it sustaining? I mean, I don't... I I can't really say that it's present um, and it's definitely not strong enough. But there were a couple of things that Brother Shamari um, said that I think are really important. Number one, on our own terms, right? Do we have people um, who are leaders but are on our own terms where we don't have any outside influence, where we're not being um, moved to assimilate, when we don't have uh, individuals coming to infiltrate Black spaces um, do we have that? And, and we definitely do not, right? I, I think we've gotten to the point where we are so afraid of doing anything without the support of white folks, you know, um, that it becomes challenging for us to move in our own spaces on our own terms. We don't even know what that means. Like a lot of us don't know. I'm quite sure all of us who are on the call right now understand what that means, but I'm not sure that we really know what that means to move in our own spaces on our own terms. And then something else Brother Shamari said that um, I think is really important too is that we have people who can talk a good game mm -hmm. and because they can talk a good game, we laud them as leaders. Now we can look at a lot of celebrities and we have a lot of folks, young folks, old folks who laud them as leaders. They're not leaders, they don't speak for me. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, and we can argue back and forth about uh, you know, different celebrities or whatever, but Ice Cube don't speak for me. <laughs> as a black woman, he doesn't speak for me, right? Mm -hmm. As a black woman who, you know, um, doesn't make a whole lot of money, hasn't made any films, you know, not out there, you know, doing what I do, um, he doesn't speak for me. He's mm -hmm. not my voice, right? Mm -hmm. So to put something out there, and I'm not just picking on him, I'm saying in terms of a lot of people, right. um, you, you don't get to speak for me. You don't get to put things out there and say, I'm doing this for the black community. No, no, no. Not mm -hmm. when you haven't had the opportunity to come and speak with people that you claim to be speaking for. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think Brother Shamari hit the nail on the head he, with all of the points that he that he made. But I think those are two important things that we really have to look at our own spaces that are run on our mm -hmm. own terms. And what does that look like? And then also lauding individuals. We got to get out of this culture of lauding individuals who don't deserve our fellowship. Because as a leader, you have to earn it. You have mm -hmm. to earn me to follow. Like you have to earn that. And many people have not done that, especially celebrities who believe that writing a check is going to cure all, right? Or believe that the green is going to get them into spaces that um, are going to make them better. It, it doesn't work like that, you know? And I think that, you know, as Black people, we have got to get out of the space of yeah. looking at celebrities, lead me, follow me, give me, give me. This is not how this works, yeah. you know? And if we're not going to stand strong in our own spaces and shut the door, Mm -hmm. on some folks that don't belong in those spaces, mm -hmm. then we're not going to be able to get to where we need to be. Yeah, wow, that's that's a powerful point because we do have to move to that space of, you know, demanding what we want out of our leaders, but then also, you know, as both you and Shamari alluded to, there's a challenge in fellowship, right? So, so uh, Nikki, I want to come to you, as, as Jacqueline alluded to, as a Black woman in this space of uh, demanding mm -hmm. uh, understanding of leadership, how do we... Mm -hmm. Make sure, because um, you, you've been very active, Nikki, on various different levels, politically, uh, economically, socially. How do we make sure that we develop the, the not only the ability to be a leader, but the understanding of the, the, the galvanized followers? Because that's important. 
right? So how do we do that from the from the aspect of being, of course, a black woman and just a leader in general? Because I think that's us to talk about. So here's the thing: I, I would never downplay the leaders, and, and so there is a difference to me. This is my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think there's way too many public figures. There's way too many influencers. There's not enough leaders, but I would never discount the leadership because to me, a great, I, the reason why I am who I am because there were leaders who came before me, right? So I think that we don't have a powerful movement. That's different, right? Mm -hmm. So I understand the leaders. I believe that we do have effective leaders, but the problem is a movement, right? So I remember sitting in a room with um, Jesse Jackson's wife. And all of these people were getting up, screaming, hollering, I did this. She said, she stood up and she was like, y'all all need to sit down and shut up. She said, I'm so tired of influencers. I'm so tired of people standing up. She said, in order for you to qualify a leader, you have to be willing to sacrifice everything in your life for the cause. The only reason why we survived is because there needed to be somebody left to tell the story. They turned our lives upside down. They, they tried to kill me and my husband, but for some reason or another, God spared our lives and allowed us to tell the story. The people that, that were leaders back then died for a cause. They put everything in for a cause. So I believe the movement is weak, but part of the fact that we have a weak movement is because we know for 400 and something years, we have lived in a society that systematically tried to destroy us as a people. And until we understand first how to address the mental health issues that's caused from all this generational residue mm -hmm. and being able to have people acknowledge, our own people acknowledge the pain and the trauma and the wounds that we have went through the last 400 years, there is not going to be effective leadership because everybody, in order for something to be effective, everybody has to have everything in common. To me, the reason why the civil movement was so strong, because we didn't have anything but each other. We didn't have all the money. We didn't have all the opportunity. All we had was one another. There was no child not left fed. We were a community of people. Society has literally oozed in and broken us up because we get a, a bunch of folks and then all of a sudden we on this bandwagon, we ain't thinking about you. No, right. the only way we can break this company down economically, one, because we, we exchange dollar for dollar more than any other person. So mm. me, you know how you get at this society? Stop buying their stuff, mm. right? Take all our money and put it in our own community, right? Mm. That's a whole other thing. But <laughs> until we know what it is to have an effective movement, Mm -hmm. To me, that is the difference. It has nothing to do with leadership and influencers. It has everything to do with a effective movement that mm -hmm. everybody has the same mindset in common. So mm -hmm. then we can move forward. So so now now let me bring this. This is my thought. No, no, I, we appreciate that because that movement is, is, is quintessential to leadership because you have to move the people in a direction or lead them in a direction. So that movement is important. And, and I want to uh, have you, Dave, uh, Gabe, uh, dialogue about that because you do a lot of advocacy work, youth advocacy and community advocacy. So talk about that need for movement and that need for also understanding that a leader's role in that movement has to build momentum to, to bring to surface the change that's needed. Sure. And I really appreciate, um, you know, my panelists on this conversation. I think it, it, it allows us to kind of think critically about what needs to happen next, particularly for 2021 and beyond. You know, as somebody who's had to help um, and assist with launching several campaigns over the years, you know, I actually take the position that we've actually got plenty of leaders. Now, we don't have any black messiahs. I'll say that emphatically. We have no black messiahs. And to me, that, that's actually a good thing. But I think we have plenty of leaders. Uh, we have plenty of folks who are, you know, quote unquote, people who are, quote unquote, directing action in certain regards uh, across the country. They are guiding conversation, they are guiding policy, they are guiding legislation. Uh, they're guiding movement in different neighborhoods and communities. I think we have that. Um, I think the challenge is that it's disconnected. And what I mean by that is not only is it siloed, there's not an ability for folks to connect and realize that, guess what? What you're doing in North Philadelphia is similar to what I'm doing in South Philadelphia, which is similar to what somebody's doing in South Carolina, which is similar to what somebody's doing in South Central LA, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, how do we build structures and an infrastructure for the leaders to come together more, share best practices more, and understand more how much these issues are interconnected. I think that 
might be issue, which is what Nick, you're talking about as far as the movement piece, right? And I would even argue to a certain extent that we have, again, we have movements, but they're not as, I think what happens is that to a certain extent, we've all watched, and perhaps some of us even with the part of, you know, many of the movements of past, and we're looking for something that looks a certain type of way. I think yeah. that's part of the issue, right? We want, we've seen the, we've seen, you know, King is the Kings of the world, the Fred Hamptons of the world, the Malcolm X's of the world, and the Elijah Muhammad's of the world, and the Garvey's of the world, and the Ida B. Wells's of the world, and, and what it looks like from afar, decades removed, mind you, um, yeah. what their movements look like. And we're looking for it to be mirrored in 2021, not recognizing that it might look different. You know, imagine if Frederick Douglass had Twitter. Heck, a, lab, heck, yeah. a library. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. we don't even think about these, these simple realities mm -hmm. of, of things that we've had, that we've had. Like, I know plenty of digital organizers who do plenty of outstanding work. It might be all on their phone, but they do plenty of outstanding work to raise the consciousness of the people and guide them to, a, to an end game. That's important work. That doesn't mean that they are, does that mean that they're akin to, you know, Queen Mother Moore? Maybe uh -huh. not, right? But mm -hmm. are they a leader? I would say yes, because what yeah. they're doing is that they're trying to move the needle on a particular campaign or a particular effort mm -hmm. that's needed by black people. And I'll end with this. You know, Ella Baker said so wisely and so and so perfectly, you know, strong people don't need strong leaders. Mm -hmm. That's Ella Baker 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And whenever i whenever I see that context of what she was trying to say, she was trying to say, look, leadership is gonna be bottom up, not not top down. She understood this 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, she she was the one wrestling and grappling yeah. with the kings of the world about leadership and what it means and what has to happen when she mm -hmm. was with SNCC and with SCLC, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's important to kind of recognize that too. Yeah, and you you, you bring up look like you want to jump in there, brother Shamari. You know, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on the script. I'm gonna stay on the script. Okay. I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just saw your face like you wanted yeah, to jump in on the comments. It's, it's in there, I do, but I'm I'm gonna honor the script for right now. Good. <laughs> Okay, cool, cool. Uh, but if we can go off script because I want this to be really a great dialogue. But I wanted to just just also just bring into context because something Gabe mentioned, which was something a friend of mine told me a while ago, is that we're not outnumbered, we're out organized. And so when we think about the understanding of how we have to build black leadership and understand we have to have the movement that'll keep us to go progressively forward, Somebody we have to look at, yeah, I got that. Um, we have to look at how do we get ourselves in a space of you know, being organized effectively. And, and I want to come to you, Jackie, to, to talk about that. We're not outnumbered, we're out organized because again, uh, black people are soon become, you know, no longer the mon minority. They're becoming a majority in some spaces in some areas, right? And so that whole paradigm of us being a minority will change numerically, but we'll still be out organized in a lot of spaces so that even if we have effective or good leadership, if we are not organized, we will still not make any progress. So how, how, do, how do we then move to a space of organization based upon, again, what Gabe just shared about the quote by Ella Baker, strong people don't need strong leaders, but we do need strong organization. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have thoughts on that, but um, I actually, if I could, would like to hear um, either Nikki or uh, Gabe or Brother Shamari talk about that. I think that, um, their take on that will be a little, a little different um, from mine. So I, I would actually love to hear that. So if I, I can defer um, to, to one of them to speak on that, um, I think they would have some good nuggets to drop for us. I don't know if I got good nuggets, but I definitely want to <laughs> chime in because it, it's vibing off of it. You know, for me, it's real important that we really, you know, I'm focused on the resurrecting of the Black Messiah part. And I agree with Gabe, but for different reasons about this need. You know, this idea that we have plenty of leaders, but not a messiah. And I think that's an important statement, but I disagree with, you know, where, where he framed it. And I want to, but it's important for me because I got to frame where I come at this from and honor my space. So going back to where we are, your question, I don't know that, that that's a, a, a quantitative, maybe even a qualitative question about whether we're out organized. I think the bigger problem for us is that we're out intention. Okay. We our intentions as to who we are and what our relationship is mm -hmm. with the place where we are mm -hmm. is confused. And we don't have a clear declarative intention for me to our own sovereignty mm -hmm. in this place. 
which is where the Messiah thing comes in. I want to be very clear. That's why we, we, we're, we're scared of the word messianic, but Messiah at its core, and we've had them. And that's why COINTELPRO was framed. It didn't say it was scared against the black leaders. It never said that. Right. It's specifically out of nowhere, because none of them proclaimed themselves to be the Messiah. Fred Hampton didn't say I'm the Messiah. Malcolm didn't say it. But J. Edgar Hoover and COINTELPRO picked that word for a reason, because it has a definition. Mm -hmm. And messiahs are anointed kings. And when you're a king of something, that means you're declaring your own sovereignty that then disregards the order that you're subjected to. Right. And that's why, that's why they had to be resisted. Mm -hmm. That's a different mindset. It's a different set of work. It's a different declaration of intention. Mm -hmm. And see, white people have declared manifest destiny, white supremacy, and they organize around that intention. We right. as black people in America have not yet declared sovereignty as our intention, and therefore we don't have an organizational apparatus nor leadership structure that's building into that intention of sovereignty. We got leaders. But we really got managers. We have people who are saying, I will lead you as long as the intention is diversity, inclusion, and equity. Yeah. And so those people are bound. Mm -hmm. I will lead you as long as you recognize that I'm like you, that my life matters. We got those. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about Marcus Mosiah Garvey, who said, no, we will create our own sense of sovereignty and we will organize around that. Mm -hmm. People need to understand that that's where Malcolm was going when he said, I reject the civil rights movement and I reject that this country has any sway over my rights as a human being, as a man. I'm taking our case to the United Nations. I am bonding with my brothers across the Afro-American diaspora, mm -hmm. which was bigger than America, and then in connection with the African diaspora. That's a different sense of his sovereignty, our sovereignty as a people. And I am saying, if we want to call that Messiah, which is what Messiah means, mm -hmm. and then the leaders and the followers and the, and the friends of that, that is what we need to get back to. Because I we have not, when they came after Fred Hampton, mm -hmm. that's the psychology they were coming at. Yeah. They never yeah. wanted us to organize and have an intention to our own sovereignty in this space. And that is the energy and the spirit of our people that we have to resurrect, lest we die. Lest we die. And I wanna come back to that, but I also wanna get Nikki's input on, on that understanding of organization and, and outnumber, because uh, I know she she looked like she got she, she wanted to add to that. So you want me? I'm listening to, to uh, Brother Shamari. So again, this is um, something that, that's coming out of my thought. Um, so number one, I think the issue is um, that Messiah, another name, another word for Messiah is messenger, right? So this is my thing. I think that the problem is, because I organize the Women's March, I organize large events, right? And I find that I'm going to take it back to the story of Moses. Moses' uh, father-in-law sat down and said, Moses, it's 2 million people. You cannot manage 2 million people. What you have to do is bring segments of folks inside and be that leader amongst the leaders, even though I'm the one who's leading you, right? Mm -hmm. So the issue is that I find when we're dealing with large groups and large organizations, there's too many people that just want to micromanage everything. And mm -hmm. as soon as our community, we get together to try to get along with something, there is an issue with somebody else. And we find that all this work we didn't did the last three months is, is, is in vain because there's too many egos. There's too many people that just don't want to take this serve because if you're a messenger and you are a leader and you are a messiah, right? Number one, we got to get out of idolizing folks, right? We're mm -hmm. looking for a messiah. We're looking for these people, but then we get into this habit of idolizing. I need this and I need that. No, because a great leader will know, okay, I, this is a message. This is what I have. But in order for me to be successful, I have to entrust others that will work along the same messaging, that we will come together, that there will be no schisms among us. There will mm -hmm. be no issues among us. There will be no Judases in the crowd, right? That whatever we have to do, we are going to do it collectively. And we're going to understand that this one person cannot manage the whole movement of a community. 
We have to get a person that have a thought pattern to say, I'm going to, we're going to entrust each other with a group. Even though this is the vision that I have, I, the only way I can be an effective and powerful leader is the fact that we can take that me same message, duplicate it, and I can trust you over in that area. There will be no Judas's or no other agendas. The problem is we come together with all these agendas and everything that we go to do is lost. And then we find that there's schism, then there's a division again. So finding someone that we can trust to lead the greater population to kind of replicate what they're doing and mm -hmm. trust those replicators to go in their segments of the world and do the same thing so that we can collaborate, we can collaboratively come together and we can create this space economically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally so that we can move out whatever the agenda it is for our community. So I yeah, so no, that, that's great. So so the rep replication of leadership isn't isn't just in one particular area lands in one individual's responsibility It's the duplicity or multiplicity of leaders that can be across a vast uh, variety of certain industries and certain uh, sectors of life. And we have to look at that. And I guess that's where, you know, when I asked the question about organization uh, versus outnumbered, that's where I was kind of leaning to. And I greatly appreciate each one of you sharing on that because we, we still do have to look at uh, our society as a whole, right? When we look at our society as a whole, we look at, over 90% of the media is not anywhere control is controlled by white people. Over 80% of the economy economically is controlled by white people, right? And we look at all those numbers, it's always gonna skew higher towards white people in control of those sectors where we need to have black leadership on every vein and every sector taking a bit of ownership and also a sense of using Shamari's uh, ideology there, intentionality and making it an unapologetically black space. I'm gonna to come to you to Gabe with this is that, where do we find opportunities and spaces to build black leadership that's unapologetically black with intentionality? And again, I'm bouncing off of Shamari to create our sovereignty so we can have space of our own dominance without ever being subservient. And I'll say this, and, and again, I am gonna to bounce to you Gabe, and I'll say this because when we look at some organizations and individuals uh, that are black owned, they get to a position of, of, of status and success, but then they become crippled because now their funding and their dollars are now controlled by white entities and organizations. So they are no longer unapologetically black. They may support the black community, be in the, be in the black community, be from the black community, and all, but now since their dollars are no longer from the black community directly or funded from the black community, they now have to acquiesce and change. And that's where that diversity and inclusion comes in. And whenever there's diversity and inclusion, black people come out at the bottom. So Gabe, if you could just interact on that thought of how do we create that intentionality to create our own sovereignty so that leadership can surface, black leadership can surface. Yeah, I think one of the first things that we must do because language is powerful. Mm -hmm. This kind of goes back to one of uh, Jacqueline's initial points about influence. I have a friend of mine uh, who teaches in the public school system we talked about how a colleague of his, a fellow teacher in the school, uh, talked about Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X as influencers, like to children, right? Um, and we have to understand how that framework, not only is it irresponsible, um, it is probably one of the most damaging things that one can say. We have to disrupt the narrative um, of being a brand, right? I think that there's this uh, notion now amongst um, black folks that, that because of social media, because of our ability to be quote unquote out there in the mix that I have to protect my brand as, mm -hmm. a, as opposed to protecting the people. Mm -hmm. I need to secure the bag as opposed to, to secure the, the culture. And so mm -hmm. now what we got caught up in is we, we got caught up into your point, some of these, uh, you know, capitalist, you know, mindsets and uber capitalist intentions and capitalist perspectives and end games and hashtag goals and all this kind of stuff. Hashtag um, goals, and, not, yeah. and not understanding that, that the ultimate goal should be like liberation period. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to get to that point? Mm -hmm. You know, I think what I've seen over the years is that we have to build them. We have to build spaces that we can incubate leadership. What does that mean? That means that we have to go to the corridors that people don't go to. Mm -hmm. We need to go to the neighborhoods that people don't walk through. We need to go to the to um, the outlets, people who are on the, the outliers, because mm -hmm. that's where our best leadership 
has always come from, right? Uh, I remember Kwame Ture once said uh, in a speech, uh, formerly Stokely Carmichael, he was talking to a brother in the neighborhood. He said, yeah, man, you know, brother Kwame, you know, uh, I know that the uh, feds is scared of you. Kwame said, no, brother, it's scared of you because they know that I come from you. Mm. You understand? So it takes that development, that leadership, mm -hmm. that understanding that, wow, Detroit Red can be Malcolm X, right? Yeah. We have yeah. to understand that that connection. And so for me, it's it's always been about creating small ciphers, small mm -hmm. intimate spaces that can uh you know uh look like study groups, it can look like reading groups, it could look like abilities to receive training, workshop, rites of passage, mm -hmm. uh, where as Brother Shamari said, you can learn from Jegna, but you can also learn from the young warrior who has the energy and the fight and the verb and the and the drive and the energy. Um, that set of Jegna Council, along with the energy of the young boy, right, quote unquote, that has to be, I think, the synergy of how you incubate leadership. In other words, go to our most challenged corridors, family. Because, mm -hmm. but see, the problem is many of us don't want to go there, mm -hmm. right? Many of us want to stay in our privileged confines yeah. and, and all yeah. comfortable, and don't and don't want to get you know walk those streets and walk into a home that might have some challenges with utilities. But not knowing that, guess what? That person in there might have a brilliant mind that's going to yeah. contribute to the work. Yeah. So that's where we got to start at, to me. Yeah, yeah. And that, that contribution to the work is essential to the success of it of it all. I mean, it, it has to be that you know Ubuntu, Kuju, Jakalia combined effort of the people in order to have us move forward. Because you know, as we all alluded to, we all know that uh, one individual really won't be. And I know we're talking about resurrecting the Black Messiah and, and, and development of Black leadership, but it's not really residing in one person. And I hope right. participants realize that we're not ever trying to say that, hey, it's going to be this one singular person. Because again, we're not deifying anyone, any organization, individual, lifting them up to say, this is going to be the chosen one. We're not saying that, but we are saying, as we talk about leadership, there's various different sectors in our society and in our world today that we have to look at where can we position ourselves unapologetically black to be uh, organized and structured to make a move and impact and not be commodified in those spaces. Because once we're commodified, then we're uh, uh, capitalized off of it. Then we become uh, still consumers in a space where we're uh, consumed by the mindset and ideology of white supremacy and white ideology, as opposed to being empowered for our own liberation. And I know, uh, Jackie, I want to come to you with this, because we talked about the commodification of Black folk on one of our shows. So, so talk about how we have to move from that space of being non-commodified to being actually empowered in our own liberation in that space. Wow. Um, that's an interesting concept. And like you said, we did talk about this uh, particularly on the show and the challenges with that. Um, our bodies, you know, our intellect, um, everything about us is commodified. Um, from the day that we <laughs> planted our feet here in this country, we've been commodified. Um, our labor, our minds, everything has been commodified and it has not stopped. And I think what has happened is we gave the okay, right? So it got to a point where we didn't have um, sort of any choice, right? But now we're giving the okay, right? We're saying, yeah, cool, you know, um, take this and commodify it, take my poem and commodify it, take my creativity and commodify it, you know, take my, um, my urban fashion, right? My hood fashion, commodify it. Here, take it, take my music and commodify it. Do whatever you need to do with it. And we give it away. We're no longer the gatekeepers of our own culture. And that is, a, that is an incredible problem, right? Because white folks have gotten comfortable with uh, commodifying us, not paying us for our labor. Um, we just saw the other day, um, a conversation between a black woman and a white woman on, the, on a television show where, um, the white woman says to her, you have to show me that this person is racist. Teach me, show me, right? Um, and I'm of the thought that I'm no longer giving my labor to folks, right, for free. No more, right? Um, specifically to white folks. Um, I'm just not gonna give it to them for free anymore. And I think we have to be at a point where we don't do that. I think Nikki said something really important earlier. And she said that um, it's important to keep our dollar, our money, in our community. We have to stop going to these places that don't respect us and don't honor us. Um, and I think that goes too far creativity. That goes mm -hmm. too far our minds. 
um, we have to get out of that. We have to get out of it to secure the bag, as, as Gabe said, you know, um, to, to manage our brand. We got to stop that, you know? Yeah. And I think um, another important point that Gabe, Gabe also mentioned is that we have to get into these cell groups and start educating our people to say, we cannot do this anymore. We have to remove ourselves from these places of commodification. And we have to, as Shamari said earlier, Brother Shamari said earlier, we have to be in our own spaces for our own people. And until we change that mindset of, again, moving towards Black liberation of Black only spaces, we support Black businesses only, um, then I don't think we're, we're going to, we're not going to be in a good place, right? We're going to continue to spin our wheels as, as we have. Do we have Black leaders? Yeah, you know, do we have amazing community organizers? Yes, we do. Do we have people that work in our communities every day for no money, no thank yous, you know, that are not getting awards from the city, right? And are not being promoted on social media, right? We have those folks that do the tireless work. We have people who died doing the tireless work um, and have died broke doing the tireless work. What a lot of people don't know is most of our black leaders died broke. They left their lives and their children broke with no money. And so until we are ready to be in sort of that space, uh, giving it all up, um, I, I just don't know. We're just going to continue to spin our wheels. And I think that, again, it's an important concept to make sure that in our cell groups, in our communities, mm. that we're educating people. We got to remove ourselves from the mm. commodification. Again, I mean, God, you know, I love hip hop. <laughs> and the commodification of hip hop and Black music um, constantly, over and over again. We look at the African-American Museum, who funded that, mm-hmm. right? Who funded that? Okay, yeah, there was some black elite who funded that. But who, who gave the money for that? It wasn't mm-hmm. us. It wasn't us. So until we're able to be in those spaces to say, this belongs to us. We funded this. This is ours. So we make the decisions about what happens. Mm-hmm. We make the decisions about what art goes in here. We make the decision of who the art curators are of you know, who the producers are, who the people are who are making this kind of music and art. Until we're able to make those decisions, we're gonna keep in the space of being commodified. Um, and again, we gotta get into these groups and start educating our folks that we gotta move ourselves from this. Yeah, and that, that's where we, I think, will surface with the leaders and leadership that we want when we get into those groups, small cell groups, as being said here, that can begin to inform engage and inspire those individuals and, and groups to surface with leaders. Uh, I, I just want to share with the participants, if you're listening in and you have a question, I see a lot of comments are coming into the chat room and we're going to uh, be able to dialogue with some of those. But if you have specific questions, drop those questions in the chat because we're coming close to the end of our panel discussion here. But we want to definitely hear from the participants in terms of their questions and let the panelists interact with those questions. If you want to send one directly to a panelist itself, as you put it in the chat room, direct it accordingly. Um, because we do want to, again, uh, have time for the participants to share their their questions. And we're coming to the end of this panel discussion portion of our evening here. But I want to have us as as the panelists talk real quick about how do we how do we then position ourselves to be, you know, uh, surfaced as leaders in the space politically, economically and socially, Um, because those are kind of areas where we talk about black leadership. We talk about lack of you know, let me even just say, when we talk about black leadership, one of the things that comes about too is representation, right? We need to be represented. And, and in my view, sometimes that representation can kind of have a double edged sword because there can be representation, but who do they represent, right? Whether they represent the black elite, whether they represent you know, another type of black people, right? Who do they represent and who do they speak for? Much too often when there's representation, that then is not representation of us, meaning those who really have the uh, feet on the ground, uh, dirt in the nails for the grassroots work. And also, when it's talking about representation, they'll put somebody there, but who selected that person, right? Even though it's a black person there, who selected that black person? And if we don't have selection and a representation, then that still does us no good either because that selection and representation is just as important as representation in and of itself. So so as we kind of land ourselves on this part of the panel discussion, I'm going to have each one of you just share real quick. How do we get to a space of developing leadership politically, socially, economically, so that we can have a better say to move this this, uh, understanding of the Black Messiah forward, if you will? Uh, Brother Shamari, I'll start with you. I'm trying to frame your question to fit into my reality. So I'm struggling a little bit. So if I don't answer your question, it's because I, you know, I might just miss the mark on it. So I, I just want to be 
very clear about where I sit. Mm -hmm. Leadership is a role. It's a function. It's not, it's not, it's not a title for me. So leadership is, is something you do. And I, I think we got right now, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna claim this Messiah word now. Somebody need to give me the African version of what it means. But for me right now, Messiah is one who is seeking autonomous, sovereign black life, liberation, independence, freedom, and empowerment. Everybody else that y'all talking about, I call them managers. We got Messiahs and we got managers. They differentiated by where they're leading you. Managers are leading us into diversity, inclusion, and equity. Messiahs are leading us into sovereignty and kujijagali. All right. So I just I just want to be clear about where I stand. Now, America is a corporation. Corporations make commodities. So anybody who's trying to be incorporated into a corporation is signing up to be commodified. That's the definition of what this joint is. I don't care whether you are high class commodity or you are knockoff, rip off commodity that I can buy at the dollar store. <laughs> if I'm signing up to be diversified, included, and equitable in this corporation, I'm not an owner, therefore I'm a commodity. And I'm a commodity that because I'm black, I'm cast at the bottom of the culture. And so the people we're calling leaders, whether they wear dashikis or bow ties or straight ties, are managed, or, or, or even if they're leading social justice, their job is to manage us within the caste of the corporation with the as the commodities that we are. That's what we sign up for. Messiah say no, I'm not a commodity, I'm a human. And when I say human, I mean a color, hue, H-U-E, black. Mm -hmm. I manifest, I actualize, and I can negate anything that comes against me. Human, I manifest, actualize, and I can negate anything that comes against me. This thing, the terror dome, comes against us. We don't bow down, we don't take a knee, we don't submit mm -hmm. to the terror dome. So that is where the work of, quote unquote, Messiah, and I don't mean that as an individual, I mean that Messiah is a collective village calling mm -hmm. that says we will build our humanity and our sovereignty by any means necessary, regardless of where we are, and realize who we're connected to. And that is our life. Not only do we pray to die for that, if we have to, we will kill and defend for that. That's what people need to understand about Martin Luther King and nonviolence was a tactic because King and them were going into places that didn't want them as the aggressors. Yeah. So they knew that they couldn't go into Alabama and Selma with guns drawn because they were starting trouble. That's different than Malcolm and them saying, I'm not going over there at gunpoint and trying to make white people love me. They weren't storming the Capitol. Malcolm and them were saying, Fred and them were saying, we are building our village where we are. And if you come here and you mess with our village like y'all did in Tulsa, we're going to bang your ass. And we're within our sovereign rights to do that. So when people try to act like there was a conversation about violence and nonviolence, it was two different things. Yeah. King was a leader who was trying to, through nonviolence, be managed and allow Black people to be managed into the corporation called America. Okay. Most of the other leaders we're talking about saying, no, that's not my job. Mm -hmm. I am going to create my own village. We are going to create our own spaces. We're going to create our own sovereignty and we're going to defend it by any means necessary. I don't know that we have yet psychologically decided that that is the work of our people. That is the village building that we are doing and then organizing our intentions around that. If we are, my last point, Ironically, the playbook has been left for us. Mm. Go look at, and I, I'm going I'm to I'm go left on y'all. Go look at Coenzel Pro, the five points. And everything they tried to prevent, let's start doing. Because they told you what they were scared of because that's what our people were doing. Yeah. They were yeah. So if you go and you just go read the five points of what, what got them so upset, and they said, we wanted to prevent the coalition. Then let's start being a coalition of black militant or uh, black nationalist groups. Let's raise up the messiahs, the neos and the morpheuses and the jednas that we need. Let's restore our dignity and worth such that we have no problem protecting ourselves from any form of aggression 
white to black or even black to black. Let's make black nationalism great again. Ha ha ha. And then let's still black nationalist vision, intention, and purpose in the preparation of our young people. We have not, we don't even talk to our young people from the, from the sense of saying, little boy, little girl, I'm teaching you, I'm preaching to you, I'm raising you, I'm parenting you into your own sovereignty. That's what, that's what it's time for us to do, lest we die. It's really that simple. Yeah, and, yeah, and I mean, you you laid the nail right on, you hit the nail right on the head with that because we have to get to that space of you know uh, what are we going to do to have those conversations with our youth to understanding that you know we need to move away from how we've been indoctrinized into this you know ideology of America right and we've become so indoctrinized to this ideology of America that we've you know, accepted every standard. And when the oppressor sets the standard, we always come out at the bottom. Um, so we have to move away from that because if not, we will never have that opportunity for the Messiah, that leader, that messenger, um, that chosen one to come to, to surface. Uh, Nikki, um, your thoughts, building black leadership, politically, socially, economically, to get to the space of making an impact that we need. So I, I, I love what um, Brother Shamari was saying. I understand his thoughts. So I believe that um, the thought, right, and the and the spirit of rising a messiah, raising messiah, or bringing forth a messiah. I believe that I have hope in my heart, and I see a lot, and I believe that it's happening. Right? I don't think it's happening fast enough because um, we have a generation of young people that um, it's all or nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, being as though they've seen the baby boomers, they see our generation and they saw some of the things that we went through. And there, I have millennials, um, I have five adult kids and I have, um, I have a 12 year old and my 12 year old has an older thought pattern than all of them, right? And, and my adults are from 21 to 30. I've always was inclusive about everything I did with them. I decided to stay in my community, even though they're like, mom, you need to move. Um, I have a filmmaker. I have a, um, a young black a daughter who's in a construction business, even though she went to school for, um, for communications, right? I, I've raised a bunch of young people that are all or nothing, right? So being able to include them and taking our youth and walking alongside of these struggles are very important. But I believe that it should be two parallel things going on. One, as Brother Shamari said, we should be creating our own spaces right, coming together, trying to figure what that will look like. But we also need a group of people that will have to be the first. Those mm -hmm. folks who are gonna dismantle the system, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be the first black woman, right? I ran for office and I'm telling you, running for office, I was like, these devils is out here. I mean, it's, it's real out here. So we need to, listen, I'm gonna be honest. We have to have people that are willing to sacrifice their first. I was also the insubordinate black woman who sat in the corporate offices. I would be the one that said, well, do anybody got something to say? And they took a deep breath because they knew I was going to open my mouth. Uh, Yet I'm looking, there's a hundred people in this room. Mm -hmm. We are managing the healthcare of public health. And if you look in Philadelphia, African-Americans are the ones who are needing assistance and have assistance. Yet the white, white, a white woman is the number one Medicaid person. But when I'm looking in this room, there's not enough of people who look like me for you to even talk about we need to sit down and work. Mm. So for me, it was important for me to be that, as they say, insubordinate black woman who's going to stand my ground in this corporate setting and say, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to go for that. This is not what we need. We need to bring people who look like us. We need to make sure that we're in spaces and places where we need to do what we have to do out in these communities and be not scared to go there. So I think it's important as this thought pattern, as this, um, as this, this spirit of raising the Messiah, we have to create our own spaces because we need people who are going to do the work to create mm -hmm. our own spaces. At the same time, we need dismantlers that are going to come in to be the first that is going to dismantle this system that has been built in this nation year after year after year. And in all of it, we need to let our young people's voices because sometimes we have to move out of the way and let them tell their own story as we're building. Every, it, it bothers me 
And as you guys know, who work with young people, we forever got these old heads sitting around talking about what these young people need in the street. But yet when you look around, there is nobody their age. We need a six year old. We need a 16 year old. We need a 13 year old because they can't, we can't see through their eyes. What they go through is not because there were loyalty on the street when we were growing up. We would dare not disrespect our elder. These children right now don't have no loyalty to nobody out there. And that's why 80% of them, when it talked about the 500 and something homicides, were our young black men. So we have to make sure that we work parallel, dismantle the system with those who want to, who want to go in to dismantle to be the first, at the same time create spaces that we can grow economically and we can put our own dollars so that I can wear FUBU instead of Nike, right? Show these young people that there is value. The commodity issue is we do not value ourselves. And until we understand our value means everything to us mm -hmm. and we have a price on our own value and I will not sell myself, nor would I sell my community for anything, we're not going to be able to change it. Wow. Wow. Powerful. Thanks, Nikki, for adding that. Gabe, as Nikki was talking about bringing youth voice into that space, one of the areas of your expertise is youth advocacy. And throughout this course of the space of your work that I've known you for, you've developed I could say gazillions amount of youth leaders. So talk about that aspect of how do we do that and how do we continue to sustain that? Because it's it's not an easy thing, right? To, to develop youth leaders and then sustain that. So your expertise is in that area. So speak a little bit about that. And Jacqueline, I'm gonna to come to you before we uh, transition over to the panelists, uh, to the questions in the chat about how do we then move forward for black women in leadership? So Gabe, if you could. Yeah. Um... You know, last summer during the uprisings, um, I had a young man that I worked with uh, who attended that first large uh, action at the art museum with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, all the names, you know. And he said, Gabe, I want to get organized. I want to I do more. I said, let's, up. let's do it. And subsequently, there were tons of rallies in the streets. And I said, you're not going to any of them. Yo, Mr. Gabe, I'm, you know, Saturday, there's going to be some at Malcolm's Park. No, you're not. I said, but what I need you to do is, um, you know, comrades making a flyer. I want you to take a look at the flyer and look it over and spell check. Um, and then come back to me. Let me know that that is spelled, everything's spelled correctly. Graphics are going, all right, Gabe, I got it done. Cool. And um, the, the following week, he was like, yeah, man, you know what I'm saying? You know, rally is going down City Hall. I said, no, you're not going. Um, but what you will do is there's going to be a mutual aid. Um, they're going to be giving out food on the corner. Um, I want you to participate in that in that in that in that uh, process um, instead of the rally. Oh, okay, by, by me it's going to be thousands of people. I know, I understand, but I want you over here. You know, by August, you know, Black August, mind you. You know, he was getting frustrated. He he, he been frustrated. He was pissed at me, um, and he was like, "Yo, Gabe, this is going to be a big thing again." You know, down in the Parkway. I said, what's up? I said, what's up? I said, I said, I said you want to go, right? He said, yeah. I said, nah. And I gave him, I gave him a sort of dad brother by George Jackson. What I'm trying to say is this. When I talk about incubating leadership and creating leadership, we have to understand that even with them, there's going to be energy, vibrancy. And I was the one even helping out with those rallies. But I was I had, to, I had to, him to understand he's 21 years old. I said, look, bro, the work ain't just the rally. The work ain't just the march. The work ain't just putting your fists up. The work ain't just holding the sign. The work ain't just, because he was kind of new to this, right? He, he just finished from TCP. He trying to, you know what I'm saying, get his feet wet. I said, this is how you get your feet wet. I said, I cut my teeth and organizing by doing the work that's, that's behind the scenes, not the one that's, that, that, that now you can post, you know what I'm saying, you know, with your phone. That ain't the work, that, it's, it's part of it. But it shouldn't be your primary goal of intention. So you want to post it on Instagram and show your homies. I, I get it. We get we understand why. Um, but I want you to understand if you're really about this, um, you know, what it's going to take to really be about this. Um, a number was, was brought up earlier, 8 billion. You know, Philadelphia's what, 1.5, 1.6 million? You gotta also register the, 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 the impact of a critical mass, right? There are elders here in the city, in the city of Philadelphia. Who remember when Philadelphia was only a million people? In fact, this elder here in Philadelphia who remember when Philadelphia was eight hundred thousand people. What happens to a system when you add eight hundred thousand additional people to a system to the same confined space? 
because the space hasn't grown, mm-hmm. right? But we've added 800,000 to 600,000 in, in a certain time period, right? Of course, the issues, the concerns, the deprivation, the disparities are gonna exacerbate. So what tends to happen is again, and again, I tend to be an eternal optimist. I understand that, that's gay, right? I get it. But I also understand how numbers work, right? And I understand, oh, it's not so much that we don't have le- the leadership that we need, it's that we just got so much more work to do, which means we need so much more people that we gotta bring in. That's the, that's the thing for me. And so I'll close by saying this, we need to have an enriched political sophistication and an enriched spiritual sophistication. You know, Brother Shamari put in the chat some amazing ideas that for, for me are fundamental to what we need to do from a space of sovereignty, from a space of what we need to do like starting now, right? Um, so I think I think Shamari for those uh, concepts. That's where we're at. We got to have heightened political sophistication and heightened spiritual awakening to get to a better place. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And Jack. I want to have you interact with a quote from Audre Lorde as you talk about Black leadership for women. Uh, Audre Lorde says, I'm deliberate and afraid of nothing. Um, and that comes as a powerful you know, edict for Black women in leadership because there has to be that deliberate nature and unafraid nature of a Black woman being in leadership in today's society or throughout the history of society. So talk about that, if you will. Um. I'm going to make it short and I'm only going to say one thing. You can't do nothing on this earth without Black women. So in those spaces that exclude Black women, you are doing yourself a complete disservice um, in any space that you're trying to create, do, dismantle, fix, whatever it is you're trying to do. You can't do anything without the power of a Black woman, either in leadership um, in support roles, preferably in leadership, but um, also in support roles. Black women cannot be excluded from any seat at any table um, because you will fail. You will fail every time. And that does not mean put us on the side and have us handed out water. I've seen too much of that um, in communities. Here you go, sister, hand out the food. Here you go, sister, hand out the water. Um, and that's cool because there are some sisters that that's what they want to do. And I'm with that. And I thank you for your service. However, when you have no women, no black women in positions of leadership whose voices are not heard and all you do is relegate the sisters to frying the fish and um, handing out water, we got a problem. We have a problem. And so um, again, the only thing I'll say is you will fail every time Mm -hmm. if you do not have a black woman Mm -hmm. having at your table. And that's that's true. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's an amen moment right there for sure. That's an amen. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, because well, say amen, is- but I'm gonna say I'm scared of some stuff. I, I like the Audre Lord quote, but I ain't gonna and that might be the difference between brothers and sisters. I don't know, man. There's some yes. stuff I, I, I will admit that I'm scared. I have some fears and I'm scared of some stuff. I hope I get so my goal is to gain the courage and the strategy to overcome the fear that mm-hmm. I'm gonna admit. I'm scared of some stuff and I really want, I really, so that's why strategy becomes important because, you know, we can't rush into every battle. I like, I like, and I was actually surprised by some of the stuff Gabe said, because I thought Gabe was telling everybody to go to every rally he ever held. And <laughs> So to know that he's behind the scenes saying, no, nah, bro, you 21 and my young black male. My young exactly, man. So that, like out of everything I just experienced, man, that, that was a profound realization for me because I was like, that Gabe so, to hear that, that's like strategy, because sometimes your body type, your position, your gender, your energy is going to bring a different response. And none of us are into making martyrs. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. We, we associate this, I, this conversation around leadership and Messiah with martyrdom. We got to right. break that spirit. That's yeah. one spirit we definitely got to break. Yeah. But, but yeah, I Shimon, will say- I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on that and then you can jump in real real quick, Nikki. Uh, the the the, mm-hmm. the thought behind that, the reason why, of course, we see martyrdom and Messiah is because it's tied to a religious affiliation. That word Messiah and, and, and resurrection, right? It's tied to that. So therefore, when we talk Messiah, we are, and I'm saying we as a collective, we we are looking at okay, if I'm a Messiah, then I gotta die. No, you you know what I mean. So so that's kind of. 
that oh, that's the ideology. I'm not saying that's the truth, though. I'm not saying that's the well, truth. We can do a whole, but actually, it's not. It's it's our adaptation. If we were to, right. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get in trouble on this one. But if we were to actually, but, but hold up, hold up. Before you get in trouble, before you get in trouble, let me let Nikki come in because she was about to say something before I I, I cut her. Yeah, off. I was gonna say something about the women. So this is my thought, and it's I've been telling a lot of people lately, and my motto. They've never made places, they've never made had a seat for black people, black women at the table. So I have my, I call it my fold out table that I wear on my back that I will pop open at any time because I don't need your table. You never made room for it with me. And then I have an umbrella and some shades because you need to understand that when I bring my table, this table belongs for me. This play table is my space. I'm getting out of people that irritates me when people say they want to make room. You've never made room for me. So I'm going to keep my fold out table because it needs to be mobile. So everywhere I go, I can pull this thing off my back and open it up and pop it down right on top of yours and then give you my umbrella and my shade to help you understand that all this here belongs to me. So if we understand as black women that we have the Eve gene, life started within us that we again value ourselves and know our positioning. I'm not gonna receive that I'm an angry black woman. I'm a passionate woman who you have not li listened to. So I had to raise my voice a little bit higher. So now you can clarify. Cause you know, when your mama talks soft to you sometimes you don't get it. But as soon as she raises her mouth a little bit then everybody wanna look and then they scared. So I think we have to understand that we don't have to be at nobody's table. Yo, yeah. we gotta bring our own table and set up our own shop. All right, so I just wanted good. to say that good. real That's quick. <laughs> yeah, wow, another amen moment for sure. Bring your own table. I like that. I like that. Um, and, and so, Gabe, look like you were going to jump in on that. I was just saying, Ashe, I was just, I, oh. <laughs> I was on mute. I just, I, I'm in agreement, and I think you know, even to that point, it it reminds me that although you know we got to build the spaces, one would argue we have the spaces. We just got to reorient them. We have to reorient these spaces. We gotta, we gotta, you know, redevelop the safe spaces that we already have, right? We gotta, we gotta go to some attics and basements and put some stuff up on the walls and say, hey, are we doing the work that we're supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. And reassess. And if we're not up to speed, we need to like redo what we're doing because we got tons of black faces in Philadelphia and across the country, but we might just have to just re-register and redevelop those spaces um, to a proper structure. Cool. Cool. <laughs> So the great conversation for all, great dialogue about resurrecting the black leadership and what does it mean? How do we get there? Uh, how is it defined, um, you know, strategy for it? Uh, greatly appreciate all of your insight and input. Uh, there were a lot of comments in the chat room and through the course of the comments, uh, based upon some of the uh, notes that were directed to me, seems like we addressed all of the concerns throughout the chat. So that's an awesome thing when the dialogue can take care of the questions at the same time. So, so that was great. So with that being said, I'm gonna just kind of continue with this vein of our, our evening here with the discussion that we're having. And as we get close to the 7.30 time, which is when this is gonna be over, I wanna suggest each one of us take a moment, if you will, in your own unique way to kind of put into the capsulization of what we just talked about and resurrecting black leadership and how do we just move this conversation and this idea of black leadership, how do we move this forward? Because one of the things I want us to look at for these conversations that we've been having, we had one last month about uh, one night in Miami, we're having this one this month, and we're gonna be having another one coming up about the black dollar, how we spend is how we elevate. Um, so these are gonna be conversations that are gonna be progressive in that space. So each one of you, if you can just kind of uh, end on your encapsulating thought, a thing that you can have us move forward with, and then we can continue to build because I appreciate that from each one of you. And for the participants, I started the poll. If you wanna participate or join the next uh, conversation, you can sign up for that. And if you wanna hear from any of the other panelists directly, you can you know, fill out the poll that's going on now. So the participants, if you can do that, that would be great. But again, I'm gonna start in alphabetical order for, with the last round of comments. And such as I started, Nikki, you'll be first and then we'll go from there. Yes, I, I just believe, I believe in us as a people. I believe that um, we are um, resilient. I believe that although things get a little, you, you know, crazy at times, I believe that we are raising up a generation of young people that we can trust, you know, with the next generation. I think that the Messiah, the thought of the Messiah is arising. I think that um, people are understanding, Black folk across the world are understanding their value. And I think that as long as we understand that we are in this together, that we have a mindset to want to change, 
and to do better as a community, I know it's coming. So I believe in our, in our culture. I believe um, that we are worthy. I believe in our value. And I believe that our leaders are here. Um, we just got to find our way home to one another. Mm. That's all. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, and, and let me just add real quick, Nikki. So before we go to the next uh, panelist, give our participants any information how they can contact you. Because even though- oh, sure. They, yes, they my email still, is they, simple. They it's my name. It's Nikki, N-I-K-K-I at NikkiBagby.com, N-I-K-K-I at N-I-K-K-I, B-A-G-B-Y.com. We are working on, we're having a Black men's panel that's coming up for our youth. We have brothers from all over the country. Um, so we will consider, I'm working with the Black Brother Leadership Council, which is a, a bunch of CEOs have come together, tired of everybody else, and we're just supporting one another in our community. So we'll send you more information. I just want to thank you, Jeff, for this space. And thank you, brothers. Um, the one thing I want y'all to know, y'all have been the number one threat of this world. I want you to know that I believe in you. I want you to, um, our sisters are allowing um, you to some extent to move in your rightful position. I'm not saying that you never was, but we are, you know, women are resilient. I think so long that our men have been um, so looked down upon that um, it's, it's our job as, as women to understand that we are, uh, to not only uplift our brothers, but also speak in spaces and places in their lives to help them to be encouraged and help them know that who they are in our, in our community. Thank you, I appreciate that. Brother Gay, closing last for Mark's thoughts and move forward ideas. Yeah, well, first of all, I just wanna, uh, again, give thanks to, to you, Brother Jeff. Um, for this space and for this opportunity to have this important conversation. I think it's something that hopefully will um, feed and nurture somebody's leadership um, out there in the digital world. Um, I also want to um, give a special you know, salute, shout out to Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., um, who although we didn't you know, obviously cover the film as much, it's important to raise up the fact that here's a, a man who was in the belly of his mama, mama comrade, who and Jerry, um, when the you know, Chicago Police Department you know, shot and assassinated you know, Mark Clark and Chairman Fred Sr. And so I do want to give love and, and appreciation to that family in Chicago um, for their ongoing work through the decades um, as they've been, you know, um, attacked and continue to, you know, terrorized by a system that hates them. Um, we have an ancestral obligation, you know, from West Philly to West Africa mm. to figure out a way to solve the problems that we find ourselves, you know, in the midst of. And I really want to leave folks with this thought that, you know, the more the most important part or minute or moment about this evening's event is tomorrow. You know, mm -hmm. we've all had a chance to to, you know, take in all these thoughts and ideas. You know, maybe talk to our partners and spouses about it. Maybe talk to our roommates about it. Think about it. Maybe watch a little TV. Maybe have a meal, and then process it as we go to sleep. And then hopefully wake up in the morning and figuring out, okay, what can I do differently and stronger with more wisdom to approach the issues that we find ourselves in. So hopefully tomorrow will be at a very important moment um, as we all open our eyes in the morning. All right, I appreciate that, Gabe. Brother Shamar. Yeah, Franz Fanon has one of my favorite quotes. He says, uh, these generation must out of relative obscurity discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. I think it's very important um, in that vein that we break this association between uh, Messiah and martyrdom. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a whole other conversation, but we've been taught wrong because where we get it from comes from a particular place, uh, particularly the way Christianity is taught. Um, it, that the the martyr took the martyrdom part doesn't go with the messiah part if you understand what messiah means um and, and each generate we gotta we gotta engage the generational obligation of messiah building messiah making that's our job that's the only way that each generation out of relative obscurity is going to discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it, is that we have to raise them and raise ourselves into that mission. And if the mission is sovereignty, that is the definition of the Messiah work, because it's just the anointed ones who bring about that sovereignty as opposed and resisting the order that's being imposed upon them. The fifth uh, platform or the fifth bullet point of the COINTELPRO program was to prevent 
militant black nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability and to prevent the long range growth of militant black organizations, especially among the youth. We cannot continue to make our young people and ourselves scared of being Messiah. That, that's what they did. They, Messiah, Fred, Messiah ship didn't end when they killed Fred Hampton. It didn't end when they killed Malcolm X. It didn't end when they killed Jesus. It didn't end when they deported Marcus Messiah Garvey, Sandra Bland. If we think that martyrdom and death is the end of our responsibility and makes us scared to raise up and collect ourselves as a village to create in all of us a sense of our calling to be Messiah, then COINTELPRO literally won. We have to break that spell. Martyrdom and Messiah are not the same thing. Messiahs win. They win their sovereignty. I'll leave it at that. Sure, I appreciate that, good brother. Jacqueline, before we wrap up for the evening. I think um, everything that we talked about, we've done, right? Um, varying perspectives. Um, each of us were passionate about very specific things. Um, but I think this is what we need to do. Of course, we need to have more action, but we also need to have really heart to heart, good conversations where egos are put aside, where we can listen and learn from each other, even if our perspectives are different, um, even if there's not a level of respect, of course, not saying any of us here, because I think we all respect each other tremendously, but I'm saying that even if there isn't a level of respect or you don't like that particular person, um, I think it's important to listen and to also have these sort of conversations. And I think we all model the way to do that. Um, more listening, less talking, mm -hmm. more understanding, less speaking, um, more empathy and less ego. And again, I think we all model that here. Um, I'm incredibly thankful for all of you. Um, you changed my perspective on several things, but also gave me talking points and thinking points to be able to move forward. Um, and so I thank you for that. I'm honored to be on this panel uh, with all of you. And um, only knew Brother Shamari when we first started, know of Brother Shamari, know of his work. Um, but I am excited to see what the rest of you are gonna be able to do. So thank you, Jeff, for the opportunity. And also thank you for all of you for um, educating, not just those of us um, who were listening, but uh, for educating us as well. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, if you if I could for for my round and closing thoughts, first, of all, I would like to say thank all the participants who logged on to take part in this conversation and drop their comments in the chat room and to know that we were able to address your concerns but virtually via the chat room was uh, gratefully appreciated and we thank you for your participation in that capacity. We also I also want to remind you that there is still the poll going on if you want to join the next conversation that we'll be having the power of the black wealth. How we spend is how we elevate. That will be a great conversation. Date hasn't been set yet for that conversation, but definitely want to uh, let you know that that'll be coming. So if you take the poll question, and fill that out, you'll be able to get the information once it's available. And if you want to reach out to any of the panelists, that's also on the poll. So please continue to fill out the poll. I see a lot of participants taking place in that. Um, also, would like to mention my good friend Reggie Williams, who helped coordinate these conversations. He's uh, joined us this evening, and my, also my good friend Ruben Jones, who helped also coordinate this. Those are two brothers who uh, lended their support in making sure that these conversations are substantive and are built towards building and not just an experience, uh, excuse me, not just an event, but an experience that we can all embrace as we elevate our Black people. So um, thank both of them for their behind the scenes work. And Reggie has a book called The Marginalized Voice, and uh, it's a must read. It's a must read, The Marginalized Voice. So for me, I think that we have to continue to look at how we look at leadership. Uh, it has different iterations, it's evolved, but it's meaningful and it's necessary. As we had throughout this conversation, the term Messiah cannot be crystallized into the space that we can only look at it one way. We should look at it in the understanding of who's not gonna just die for us, but who's gonna live for us? Who's gonna do that work? And who's gonna understand that uh, the legacy that we leave behind is built upon what we uplift. We have to uplift our elders, our women, our youth, to be a space of realizing it's the village, it's the tribe. Prior to this uh, event, I had a conversation with Brother Shamari on his radio show, and he asked me, what did I think about the village? How does the village play a part in it? And the village is essential to the leader. It's a part of how we talked about throughout this conversation. It has to be 
uh, followers, but there also has to be a village. It's the hero's journey where they are often sent to the place of conquest, coming back to the place called home. And as we find ourselves being leaders, we have to know that we have a village and a tribe, and we have to know that we have a place called home. Much too often as Black people, we find ourselves searching and lost because we don't know where home is at. But once we find home, we can find contentment, and we find contentment, we can find strength, and we find strength, we find leadership. So I thank each one of you for sharing your thoughts on where we call home and how you gained your strength and how we can find leadership through each of your voices and through this particular conversation. So again, I'm Jeff Jones, host of community, co-host of Community Voice PHL Talk Show, which airs every Tuesday at 106.5 FM. We have a YouTube channel as well, Community Voice Talk Show PHL. So follow us on that as well as SoundCloud, as well as check out Brother Shamari on Groundies with Brother Shamari on WURD, Fridays from 1 to 4, is it Brother Shamari? 1 to 4, Sunday 1 4. 6 to 8. One four and Sunday six days. So follow him and his great work, and uh, Sister Nikki follow her and her great work. And Brother Gabe, you'll see him out on the streets advocating in a in a in a corner near you. You'll see him advocating somewhere. <laughs> and of course, uh, Jacqueline Jordan, who co-hosts with me on Community Voice, you'll hear her voice as we dialogue into deeper matters. But again, be on the lookout for the next conversation: the power of Black wealth. How we spend is how we elevate. So thank you once again for spending time with us on this great conversation, Resurrection of the Black Messiah, Building Black Leadership in Our Communities. I'm Jeff Jones. Have a good evening. Take care and God bless. Stay safe and healthy.